Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm Reverend John Smith. We're at Port Elgin United Church. Uh, Sunday, August 27th, 13th Sunday of Pentecost. And uh, that means we're exactly halfway through the Pentecost season. Also, being uh, the end of August, um, that is really resonating. I eh? think it's a little loud. Uh, being uh, the end of August, I always say to myself, how come the good months go by fast and the cold months drag on, right? So already it's the end of August. Um, I don't know if you have signed up for our great balloon drop, but there's been a significant development in the balloon issue. Uh, you'll notice that it is no longer on the ceiling, but it still hasn't dropped. So you'll have to... Um, Adjust your wagers accordingly. <laughs> I'd like to thank June Van Bastelaar for filling in for me last week. Thank you, June, so much. My wife and I were celebrating our anniversary, and uh, we went away for the weekend, and uh, it was beautiful. But if, if nothing I say today makes any sense, you'll know it's because I've just had one too many celebrations. <laughs> um, Penny Inkster has an announcement. Good morning. Uh, it is with deep regret that I have to say that Wolfie's Taxi has withdrawn their services for picking up Vi and Anne-Marie and Emily and, 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 and the other taxi company won't even return my call. So as of Sunday, we have an issue of getting some of our favorite people here. So I'm looking for uh, help in how we should handle this. And so if people could speak to me after service, I'm leaving on Wednesday morning, so there's not much time for me to shake trees, but we need to find a good resolution because this just wouldn't be right if we didn't have them here with us. So if you could speak to me after church, I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Good morning. Um, I'm June Van Bachelor, and as Reverend John said, they celebrated, uh, John and he celebrated an anniversary this week, but that wasn't the only thing they celebrated. They celebrated a special birthday. I understand, Reverend John, that you may have turned a certain age. A certain age. A certain age. Uh, and uh, I would like to say, as my husband calls it, welcome to Team Canada. <laughs> Happy birthday, <laughs> Reverend John. <laughs> All right, thank you. Totally blaming Nancy for that. <laughs> My Joan? Really? <laughs> anyway, why are we here? <laughs> um, thanks uh, to Nancy and uh, Jim, who's singing today, and the worship team for helping us with our music this morning. Uh, Helen Cumming is reading our scripture today, uh, two whole chapters of the Bible, I'll have you know. And uh, we put it in condensed form so it's not so uh, lengthy. And uh, our video booth is staffed by Dan and Aidan Playfair today, so thank you very much, everybody. Let's begin with our opening refrain, open our hearts, open our minds, <coughs> open our lives to you, <coughs> O loving God.
for our call to worship. What if a living stream of grace runs in and through our lives? What if we can dip our feet into this stream and be made new? What if the stream would wash away the old crusty parts of us and leave us with shiny new reclaimed parts? What if we could plant ourselves beside this stream, dip our roots into the nourishing soil there, slurp up the life-giving sustenance from the flowing water there, let our lives slow down to the pace of a tree by a stream. There, with the strength of grace, the weeds of fear and division will be choked out. They have no room to grow. There, with the strength of grace, the weeds of distrust and judgment will wither and fade away, losing their potent force. And the flowers of the fields will bloom. They will clap their hands. The trees will stand tall and display their beauty. And all the people of the earth will join in a circle dance, praising the Creator for goodness, for, for the stream of grace and life. Our first hymn is When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Please be seated. Uh, today in our opening prayer, there is a, a moment of quiet. Uh, it's a separate slide, so uh, just know that that's coming up right at the beginning. Let us pray. <clears throat> when I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. God, when we share the sacred silence together, we breathe in your peace. When we share the sacred silence of this worship time, we breathe in your love. Even if all we received in this hour we share were those two gifts, it would be enough. Our hearts would be full, our spirits would rejoice. When we count our blessings, 
when we remember all those who made us who we are, when we stop to add gratitude to our daily lives for all the many gifts surrounding us each moment, we breathe in peace, we breathe out love. So we give thanks for one another, for our varied journeys, for our differences and our similarities. We give thanks for this time of worship, for all our singing and all our praying, and all our listening and all our speaking, bringing us closer to the breath of God. And with the breath of God flowing in us and through us, this day will be a beautiful day. Amen. Let's join together in the words of a community prayer. As I live every day, I want to be a channel for peace. May I bring love where there is hatred and healing where there is hurt joy where there is sadness, and hope where there is fear. I pray that I may always try to understand and comfort other people, as well as seeking comfort and understanding from them. Wherever possible, may I choose to be a light in the darkness, a help in times of need, and a caring, honest friend. And may justice, kindness, and peace flow from my heart forever. Amen. <clears throat> well, when I was 15, I didn't have a summer job, and so my mom and dad said, why don't you help your grandfather cut the grass at the church? He was the custodian at the church, and uh, it was a big city church with a great big lawn, and I looked at the lawn and I said, you want me to cut that? push mower. They didn't have a riding mower or anything like that. So I got on the, the push mower and pushed it around for the whole summer. And my, my granddad, every time I was there, he always had, he had a little mini fridge and he always had Coca-Cola. And we would always sit and share uh, a Coca-Cola at the end of my shift, right? There was no pay. It was just, it was just something for me to do, I'm sure and the little gift of uh, a Coke. So on the last Sunday, uh, or sorry, the last day that I was cutting the grass, um, he came up to me when we were having our Coke and he put his hands on my shoulders behind me and he said, uh, John, I want to bless you for your life. And he was thanking me, of course, for, for what I had done for him. To me, it was a chore. It was, you know, it was a burden. It was something I didn't really want to do, and yet it meant a lot to him. But, but when he offered me that blessing, <clears throat> something inside of me just kind of opened up. You know, it was I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to do or say something, but I had no idea. What I should have said was, "I bless you too." Right. When we bless somebody and they say, I bless you too, what happens is our souls open up to one another. Now in the Psalms, the Psalms talk a lot about blessing. And we've spent the whole summer thinking bits and pieces about blessing. Um, do you remember that Greek word that I taught you? Makarios? Makarios? Right, the first word of the Beatitudes, blessed, it means you are in the position of receiving God's grace, right? So when you say something uh, like you are in the position of receiving, to God, receiving God's grace to somebody else, right, they're going to say that to you. The Psalms say it back to God. Blessed are you, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's where blessing comes from, right? From our souls. And all that is within me, bless your holy name, right? My whole life, everything I have, everything I do, everything I am, I bless you, God, with it, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your inequity, heals all of your problems, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, satisfies you with good as long as you live, 
so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It goes on and on for verses. At the end, bless the Lord, O you his angels. Bless the Lord, all his hosts. Bless the Lord, all his works. Everything in the whole creation is there, here, to bless the one who created us, right? So I think we think that blessing is about receiving. It's the blessing that we receive from others, uh, like my grandfather's blessing that I received that day, a beautiful gift to me. But now I realize that what he was doing was he was setting me on a path of returning the blessing, right, to other people or to other things. I think it's the same for all of us, right? I think that we're all created to bless the world, to bless one another. And it takes a lot of courage and strength on some days to be ones who wish to bless the world, right? This morning, I'm reading from Exodus chapter 1 and Exodus chapter 2. And a little background is, for almost 400 years, most of the Hebrews had become slaves. They had to work for the Egyptians, but there got to be more and more Hebrews the Egyptians began to be afraid. And so the Pharaoh said, soon there will be more Hebrews than Egyptians. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? Well, sir, said one of the helpers, you are the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Could you do something? I guess so, said Pharaoh, and then he went and talked to Shipra and Pua. They were midwives, women who help when mothers are having their babies. And when one of the, and when one of the Hebrew women has a baby boy, the Pharaoh said, I want you to kill it. Well, the midwives Shipra and Pua could hardly believe that someone would say such a terrible thing. So between them, they made a plan. Let's tell the Pharaoh how strong the Hebrew women are. Let's say they don't need us to help with these babies much anymore. Sometimes the babies were born before they got there anyway. And Shipra told this to the Pharaoh. This was a very brave thing for the two midwives to do, because if Pharaoh had found out, he would have killed both of them. But the Pharaoh believed what Shipra and Pua had said. But he wasn't satisfied yet. The Pharaoh tried something else he gave an order to the country. When a baby boy is born, I want you to throw it in the river and drown it. And the Pharaoh sent his soldiers to look in all the houses to make sure all the baby boys were drowned. The Hebrew people had tried everything to keep their babies away from Pharaoh's soldiers. But usually, the soldiers found the babies anyway. Then there was a woman called Jochebed, and she gave birth to a baby boy, and she and her husband Amram didn't know what to do. They kept the baby hidden for a while, but as the baby grew, it became noisier. 
They knew the soldiers would find the baby and kill it. One day, Jochebed and her baby's older sister, Miriam, made a special basket for the baby. They fixed the basket so it would float on the water. Then Jochebed and Miriam took the basket to the edge of the water, to the river. They put the basket in the water among the thick reeds. The soldiers will never find the baby here. <clears throat> Miriam, please stay close so that nothing bad happens to this baby, your little brother. Imagine Miriam's surprise when she saw a princess came, come down to the river, and it was Pharaoh's daughter coming to have a bath. Now, Miriam was really worried now because... If the princess sees the basket, she'll likely call the soldiers. They will kill my baby brother. Sure enough, the princess saw the basket, and she sent one of her helpers to go and get it for her. Oh, my gosh, she said, what a beautiful baby. The little baby was crying, so the princess picked it up and cuddled it. I'm going to care for this baby as if he were my own. When Miriam heard that, she had another good idea. She ran over to the princess and said, Would you like me to find someone who can feed this baby from her breasts and take good care of it for you? Oh, yes, said the princess. So Miriam ran and got Jochebed, the mother, Take this baby and take good care of him, the princess said to Jochebed. I will pay you for your work. Later in the day, Miriam and her mother were talking about what just had happened. Marion jumped up and down and squealed with glee. She was so happy. But her mother said, shh, we don't want people to hear you. But Jochebed couldn't keep from laughing herself. All I wanted was to keep my baby from being killed by Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh's daughter is paying me to look after my own baby. I think God must have a plan for this child. When the baby got a little older, the princess took the baby to live in the palace with her. I will raise him as if he is an Egyptian. He will live like a prince in Pharaoh's palace. And I will call him Moses. And the name Moses means I drew him out of the water. And that completes our message today. Thank you.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, uh, Walter Brueggemann was a giant in the field of theology in the last 20 years of the 20th century. And one of his most famous talks was called, Will Our Faith Have Children? Uh, he wasn't talking about the demise of the Christian church or even the demise of religion in general, though many of us would c wish uh, to have him articulate that. But no, it's whether our traditions will mean anything at all. If they will inspire not the future generations, but our own generation, our own living. If our faith traditions can grow and become uh, and help us become the kind of faithful beings we would hope for. And in this world, that's a pretty tall order. When I was working full time, I used to put on workshops for my congregation. This is because I got tired of hosting Bible studies when one or two people would come. So I decided that I might embark for a time on a mission of relevance, I called it, and host studies on topics that perhaps people actually care about. I once did a study on kindness, and uh, it was about how to go beyond the school curriculum that they teach uh, about kindness as a virtue. Forty-five people showed up for that. It even spawned a Zoom study, and in that series of sessions on kindness, I had 20 participants participants, including one from Vienna, Austria, believe it or not. Faith matters, still matter. It's just that the messaging and the packaging sometimes has to be updated a little bit. You remember those movies, Sister Act, Sister Act 2? Kind of like that. According to Walter Brueggemann, our faith though, won't last if it is joyless, judgy, and unkind, right? If those who practice the Christian faith are joyless, judgy, and unkind, the faith will die out. I was raised that way, actually, right, in a faith that was actually quite judgy and quite unkind. The ministers in the church of my youth were very well respected, but they were really unkind to us. I was too young to know about the inherent judgmentalism which underlines classical Christianity, but judgmentalism is something we have all learned well. It's time to let it go. It's not a good look for the church in this century. I recently came across a story that gave me great pause. It was about a woman named Joyce who had congestive heart failure and she was in the hospital with it in the early days of the COVID pandemic. She was alone, of course, because no visitors were allowed into the hospital at that time. She was dying, but they had all the machines hooked up to her in a valiant effort to save her life, including one of those very scarce ventilators. One day she talked to the doctor and said, Doctor, it's time for me to go. Can you please call my family? I would like to speak with them one more time over FaceTime, 
if that is the best way. And then when that is complete, I would like you to unplug my ventilator and give it to someone younger than me, someone who needs it more. The young doctor was caught off guard. She didn't know what to say, except that it was something she was not allowed to do, nor did she feel it was morally right to take the life of one of her patients. The two of them had quite a conversation about ethics and morals. The doctor had been raised in a faith tradition that was extremely judgmental of such things, even when done on compassionate grounds with full consent. She said that she feared, even though she did not believe in God at all, she still feared that she would go to hell when she died. The older woman laughed at her and explained that in her mind, how could there possibly be such a place? because God was a God of life and resurrection and hope and joy. She said that what she was looking forward to was crossing over the threshold into whatever surprise awaited her because her soul was ready and she knew it was past time. The doctor arranged for the FaceTime call with Joyce's family, but she did not agree to the unplugging of the ventilator. It had been a polite clash of wills, she wrote, in the article she wrote. She said, but I am in charge. However, that night, after everyone had settled down in the hospital ward, Joyce wiggled her own way out of bed and pulled the plug. Our faith should inform our life. Right? The decisions that we make should be informed by our faith. Joyce was actively living hers, even if we don't maybe agree with what she did. She was living her faith, actively making decisions about her life based on it. How about you? I mean, do you carry your bag of values and ethics with you seven days a week? And, and does your bag of values and ethics bring you joy and help you be kind and less judgy and more open to the world because that would be my hope. That would be my dream for the church of the 21st century. In a world of chaos where morality seems quite absent, a place where a criminal still thinks he can be president, a place where a very young nurse thinks that she can kill healthy babies and get away with it. A place where housing for the poor will never be built before housing for the rich and connected. A place where a young restaurant owner in Owen Sound is beaten to death over a dinner check. A place where one of the top three tourist attractions in Ottawa, Ontario, was recently listed as the Ottawa Food Bank a place which makes you scratch your head and squint your eyes to determine if this is really real, this life that we are living. And when we face this life, we have a choice. We can make a choice on how we look at things. So I think there are more than two choices, but I'm just going to give you two today. Uh, we, one, we can see the world as chaos, right? The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Nothing we can do. There's no point in getting involved. Everything is kind of going down. It's spiraling out of control. We will just stand by and watch, right? This is a time when morals and values seem to be uh, put aside, when there's little or no room for faith or love or joy or enthusiasm. And if you think about it, described that way, our life here on earth is hell on earth. Hell on earth. That fate that the doctor feared, almost already present. How pitiful that would be. On the other hand, we can choose a posture of joyful, blessed, life-giving faith. Obviously, that's what I'm preferring, right? I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. We can choose to see beauty in the midst of great distress, 
right? We can look at that story of Joyce and see the power that woman had to make that decision for herself, right? We can, uh, we can learn about the stories around Lahaina in Maui, where many of the places who solicited donations for their staff, many of them who had lost homes and uh, people in their families, I read about one company that received so much money from their previous customers that they were able to feed and house a hundred people. That's just from one travel company in uh, Maui. A farmer in Ukraine plants thousands of acres of sunflowers every year, a crop that is exported all around the world. This year, he opened up one of the fields to allow people to walk through the towering giants that seem to bless the soul, because this is the way nature works. It encourages the people to turn their faces toward the sun, just the way the sunflowers do, yes? Toward hope, toward a new future, right? Toward future blessings, the way sunflowers do. Thousands have come to his farm, despite the constant threat of drone attacks in that country. Hope and joy are valuable commodities, and we will go to great lengths to have them in our lives. I knew a guy named Mike who had suffered a tragic car accident which permanently left him disabled, whose wife had died of breast cancer at a very young age, leaving him with a daughter, a baby daughter, he could not take care of. The baby daughter was abducted by his wife's family and raised apart from him, causing him no end of anguish and sorrow. He lived in abject poverty on ODSP, yet every month he was able to buy gifts and treats for his little baby daughter and he sued the family for visitation rights so that he could see her grow up, and he did. He had faith that in the midst of darkness, in the midst of darkness, we can do something. We can create beauty. We can look for hope. The world of faith is not just about believing a catechism of beliefs or assenting to a bunch of dogma that churches want you to believe. Um, the good news, by the way, our church does not insist that you believe all the dogma. You know, it might, we might teach it like we, like we want you to believe it, but, but you don't have to, right? That's good news. Hope that you hear that today. The world of faith is about a posture toward the world of chaos around us. When others see darkness, we find the stream of life flowing underneath. When others focus on heartless killings, when the news feed outlines all the heartless events of each day, we can st still close our eyes and hear the songs, even of mourning and blessing, coming together in sweet harmony. Our hearts become full like a tomato vine full of heavy fruit. We know that we are part of this life, and this life is part of us, and it gives us strength and hope to carry on. Can you imagine if all the people of faith stopped doing this? It would be hell on earth. Yes. So we circle back to that story of Moses in the first few chapters of the book of Exodus, because this is the beginning of a story of a new way of thinking about life. These are the opening verses, the opening shots across the bow in a story that would become life-giving and hopeful, not just for Christians, you know, many centuries later, but especially for the Jews at the time. You remember the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob, who had that fancy uh, technicolor coat we've heard about from Andrew Lloyd Webber who had delivered the Hebrew people to Egypt in a time of great famine so that they could live and work in relative safety. But there, as the scripture said, the Hebrew women were robust and had many, many babies. And uh, the men and the women were put to work building Pharaoh's vanity projects. They were, they were well cared for, they were well fed, they were hardworking people, but Pharaoh began to doubt his own power, as you know and thought that maybe the Hebrews would one day rise up to overtake him. So he decided to murder all the young boys under two. 
not going into this today, but an aside would be that if you ever would uh, compare this story to the birth of Jesus' story, uh, there are so many comparative elements. It's almost as if whoever wrote the Jesus' birth narrative uh, took uh, their cues from this story as well. A time of great sadness and fear came over the land. In Owen Sound this week, the death of Sharif Rahman was a sad event that will leave a permanent mark on our community. Can you imagine having faith that there is a way through darkness and fear if you were the members of his family? Right? When the rubber hits the road, that's what we're talking about. It takes the, the rest of us, you see, it takes the rest of us who have faith that there's a way through darkness to hold the light for them. Right? They can't hold the light right now while they're going through this trauma. Whether we're Christian or not, whether they are Christian or not, that doesn't matter. For them, we hold the Christ light. Our faith expects this of us if we take the posture that a way can be found through darkness and pain. You know, we'll never know if the birth of Moses' story is true, if it happened in the way it is described in Exodus. In the same way, we'll really know, uh, never know if the birth of Jesus' story happened the way it is described in Luke, because it doesn't matter. The point is, the stories both function as an introduction to a new plan that it's almost like God is premiering this new plan for humanity. It is the preface to a new book that God is writing in the hearts of humankind. A baby is born, always a sign that something new is happening. Oh, it's a Hebrew, it's a Hebrew baby. It's a boy. He will be killed. He won't be because something new is about to happen. And now we look at the most powerful actors in the story. They're all women. The baby's mother hides him as long as she can, Jochebed. The baby's sister, Miriam, who takes it upon herself to arrange what happens next. The midwives, Shipra and Pua, who actually stand up to Pharaoh right, and say, well, the Hebrew women don't really need us. Uh, but they facilitate the birth and the handing off to Pharaoh's daughter. The audacity of raising a Hebrew boy right in the home of the Pharaoh. The nursing mother, his actual mother. Of course, we can see all the coincidences too num numerous to note. But the reason the story functions so much here uh, is to make you understand fully that this is a birth story. Right? There's all these women, all the midwives and all the women attending the birth of this baby is to show us that a new birth is happening. Right? The story of a nation being born, emerging from a patch of weeds along a riverbank while the kingdom of the Pharaoh continues its bloody war against the Hebrew people. Right? This is how God works. Right? It's ironic that Moses was raised within the Pharaoh's temple, but it's a story of how even in the midst of darkness and pain, something new is born to carry us through it. Sufi writer Fetullah Gulen recently wrote in the magazine The Fountain, at times it is fashionable to see this world overshadowed by ash-colored heartbrokenness and disconnection. But these are never permanent because they do not originate from within the soul. They originate from outside the human spirit. And so this is the key to it all, my friends. The human spirit can and does always triumph over the constriction and darkness of this world. God works from our souls to bless the world. We may despair at the world 
and see how ugly and woe-begone it can be, we wonder, why didn't God stop all those wildfires? Why didn't God stop those murders of those little babies in that hospital in London, England? Why did God allow an innocent young man to die at the hands of three hooligans? And so, <clears throat> it's time for another minister's secret. The Moses story, at least for the Jew, is not just about a historical figure who overcame dark odds. It is a story about the seed of hope and new life that lives within each one of us, our own sea of reeds inside our hearts, from which God could pull a basket of new life. It's a story about helping us overcome the darkness of our fear or pain or despair. You know, if only we had known this when we first heard those stories back in Sunday school, we wouldn't have put them back on the shelf and never read them again. These are stories not about historical figures per se. They're about what's happening in us. The Jews recite the story of Moses and the Paso at Passover time every year in order not just to remember the birth story, but more so that they'll continue to give new birth to it. They will become the seeds of new life. And so, when our hearts are engaged with the world, we realize something truly important. Our souls are pregnant. They have not gone to sleep. In fact, they are full and vibrant, pulsing with seeds of hope and possibility. Like Moses and Miriam, they just need to be midwifed along. Midwifery, it seems, is the job of those in this world who have faith in the divine paradise all around us, which is experienced in the heart. When we take this posture, when we live our souls into the world, we find and know and claim heaven on earth. Heaven on earth, right? We can make heaven on earth happen. Walter Brueggemann asks, will our faith have children? When we turn to our souls, we will know the truth of the answer. Amen.
time to collect the offering.